Kopak begins the Yankee half of the inning by fanning Kubek with a curveball. If you were a baseball fan in the 1960s, you undoubtedly remember Sandy Koufax of the Los Angeles Dodgers, a Hall of Fame pitcher best known for his incredible curveball. They used to say that Koufax's curveball dipped so much that it looked like it rolled off a table. For years, no one was able to explain how or why a curveball or any breaking ball was able to move so dramatically. Some ball players even called it an optical illusion. Well, John McCoskey didn't think so. He wrote us asking for a scientific explanation of why a curveball curves. Well, the first thing we did was to find out just how a curveball is actually thrown. And we got some advice from one of today's best breaking ball pitchers, Ron Guidry of the New York Yankees. Well, basically what you want a curveball to do is uh, is there for an off-speed pitch, really. Mm -hmm. And what you want it to do is you want to offset the hitter and you throw a pitch that has a tendency to break slow and downward. And all a good curveball is is something that comes over, falls in. If I, I'm a left-handed pitcher, mm -hmm. if I throw one, it comes down and into a right-handed. It's an off-speed pitch. You're also very well known for your slider. Now, what's the difference between a slider and a curveball and the way it acts? Well, a curveball probably will have a bigger break because it's much slower, it has more time to break. Whereas a slider, it's a, it's a really sharp downward break. It, it, mm -hmm. Sometimes it breaks more, sometimes it breaks less, but uh, the slider was a pitch that was developed to appear to be a fastball to offset hitter's time in your fastball. Now that I knew what the ball was supposed to do, it was time to learn how to do it. I opted for a lesson on the slow breaking pitch, the curveball. Now, now the only trouble I'm going to have is a left-hander trying to teach a right-hander. You have to bear with it. Okay. Uh, so all I want you to do is just take the ball in your hand, right. which any ways that it feels comfortable. Okay. And just grab it with your fingers. Fingers like. Some, yeah, put them together. Fingers together. All right. Now you notice that your wrist is going to have to be cocked. You take this. Right. And more or less tuck it oh, in. Yeah. There. See that? Right. See the grip on this? Okay. I want you to watch the grip because I want you to. Sh to see how this comes out when I'm done okay, throwing now, it. The main thing is when you're throwing it, right? All right, and your arm comes through here, you mm -hmm. want to take this and you want to make sure that it stays right here. Right. And when you throw it, you rotate your wrist. Oh, so over. I'm going to keep so you're the just grip gonna and take it and you're going to roll it over. Just like that. Just like your go down ball. Just okay. Roll. Oh, I see. Right, just okay. Uh, Stand and get a good delivery. Let me uh, let me get up my uh, foot on the mound and do this the right way. <laughs> There you go. Uh, you can see the rotation of the ball was good. Did Too bad I wasn't close to the plate. That doesn't matter. But the rotation is <laughs> the was, rotation was good. If you can learn the rotation of a curveball, then the rest is easy. You have to learn how to rotate the ball before. I know I'm a hard act to follow, but here's the master throwing his famous breaking ball pitch. So that's how you throw a curveball, but what actually makes the spinning ball curve? To help answer that question and explore the science of the curveball is Dr. Richard Brandt, a sports physicist and professor of physics at NYU. Welcome, Dr. Brandt. Thank you. Now, you heard Ron Guidry say you have to get that ball to spin. What is there about the spinning baseball that makes it curve? Yes, actually, the flight of a spinning baseball involves a fascinating amount of physics, some of which we'll illustrate later with this wind tunnel. Oh, this is interesting. Well, we have a little uh, model baseball That's in there. That's right. It's actually a cylinder, and the motion of the wind is illustrated by the smoke. Okay. Let's refer first to the computer graphics and see how various ball trajectories go. Okay. Now. There's a black a little path that went across the top. What is that? Right. That's how a ball would travel if there were no gravity, just in a straight line. Mm -hmm. Here comes the green. Oh, that's curved down a little bit. What's that? Right. That shows the effect of gravity. Gravity pulls the ball down and makes it dip. And finally, the red trajectory there. The red trajectory shows what happens when the spin and the gravity are acting together. The spin causes further force downward, pulling the ball downward near the end of the trajectory. There really is a difference between the three. The spin really does impart that that curve. Huh? Absolutely. It could be as much as a foot of difference in distance that the ball falls. No kidding. Okay, now, how does it do it? That's the question we really want to ask. Right. That's the question we'll use the wind tunnel to answer. 
What have we got here? You see the smoke showing the direction of the wind is uniformly distributed over the top and the bottom when the ball isn't spinning. And we've got our little uh, phony ball there. That's actually on a right, cylinder, a cylinder. Right, a cylinder. tunnel. So let's make it spin. Okay. And now we see the difference. The spin is in this direction, so it drags the air underneath the ball with it to the right, making it move faster. And on top, the spin is in the opposite direction, so it mm -hmm. pushes the air back. Mm -hmm. So the net effect is that the air on the bottom is traveling faster than the air on the top. Now, there's a principle in physics called Bernoulli's principle, which says that the greater the motion or the speed of the fluid, the right. less the pressure. Right. So the speed is greater on the bottom, so the pressure is less more pressure on the top than the bottom, so there's a net effect or force downward due to the pressure difference. Now let me see if I understand this. We have the spinning ball going this way, moving against the air going in that direction. Right. Now the spin sort of sucks the air along the bottom. That's right, it drags it. It drags it and sort of blocks it on the top. Exactly. So you have it going quicker on the bottom than on the top. That's illustrated by the closeness of the right. lines at the bottom. You can really see that. Right, and there's turbulence on the top because of the anti-rotation. So the pressure on the top pushes the ball down, and the ball in flight then follows a curved path. That's right. It falls faster than it would if it were only falling due to gravity. Well, that makes sense. Now, is there any way that if I were a smart pitcher, I could make that effect work any better by doing something to the ball? Yes, there is. Actually, it's the threads on the ball that are responsible for the friction between the air and the ball that give rise to the motion of the air. The so red if, seams here? You that's right. These are the seams. And if you throw the ball so that it rotates in such a way that four seams per revolution occur, then there'll be more friction and the effect will be greater. Now, a fastball. Now, I know a fastball spins also. Why doesn't a fastball take a dive like Well, a fastball that? spins in the opposite direction. Oh, backwards. I see. When you throw the fastball, it rolls off the top fingers, so uh -huh. it has bottom spin. It turns like that, and then the opposite occurs. There's more force on the bottom than the top, so it actually falls less fast than it would if it just fell from gravity. That's very, very interesting. Now, what happens if the ball doesn't rotate at all? When uh, you get that? <laughs> and that's, that's, that's called a knuckleball, and yeah. that's actually used. Then the rotation is so slight that as the ball is traveling, right. the seams come up in different ways, and it causes deflection upward or downward or left and right in a kind of erratic, random way. Well, this certainly explains a lot of things we wanted to know about the curveball. Thank you very much, Dr. Brandt, for coming and demonstrating on your wind tunnel. I think I'm going to go out and see if I can get the ball over the plate this time. Ron Guidry showed me how to do it. Let's see if we can make it work. We'll have more in a minute.